and I'm seeing about half of the red line fill up. Okay. And I'm gonna give Richard the results of the poll in the chat just so he has them to refer to. It's okay if it's public, Susan, either way. Sorry about that. I was muted for a little bit if you said something just in case. Right, so here are the results being sent to Richard. Okay. And I'm gonna end the poll there for everyone. Okay. All right. Richard, you're up first. Do you want to get started? Sure. I want to welcome everyone to the College Roundtable, the Summer Science Program 2021. This is our most organized and formal opportunity to talk about college admissions, which tends to be a topic that's on the minds of high school juniors and rising seniors and seniors in their fall and winter time. So uh, it's, a, it's a timely subject, of course, for, for most of you. Um, we have, SSP that is, has relationships of uh, one kind or another with seven different colleges. We have host campuses, and uh, although we're not there physically, as you know, we do maintain our, our relationship and our partnership with them. And we also have three of what we call uh, well, admissions affiliates or academic affiliates, Caltech, Harvey Mudd, and MIT, where we, uh, we don't go there physically, but we uh, talk to them in partner with them and cooperate with them as well. Um, I would suggest that any of these colleges are uh, worthy of your attention, worthy of your uh, possible applications. You can decide that, but um, they're all good schools and they're all, of course, unique as uh, every college is. For today's panel, we have uh, folks from Harvey Mudd and MIT, so you'll be able to ask them questions directly. So uh, the poll results show that most of you, which is reassuring, most of you are actually confident that your college admissions process will all work out okay and you will get into a good college. Um, that's, that's reassuring. I think most years that's not the case. So maybe there's something about the pandemic that's made people more confident. I don't know. I hope so, because there's too much anxiety out there in the world. Basically, I'm bringing good news that uh, you're going to get into a good college. Um, I know that uh, you get tons of mail and email and from colleges and you get advice from your classmates and your counselors and your parents and your grandparents and websites and books. And uh, a, a lot of it is it's, it's too much, really. It's too much advice. Uh, you know, you must blah and don't forget to blah and a thousand blah, blah, blahs. So. The, the reality is that you will, you will get into a good college. I'm confident of that, and you should be too. You're going to get a great undergraduate education, and you're going to go on to the next step in your life path. So you don't need to be anxious. You don't need to feel intimidated. You need to feel, you should feel confident because you'll be fine. So turns out that you're already almost the perfect college applicant. And that's something that uh, that's what we're going to talk about today, why I say that. And you can just take my word for it that good colleges admit applicants like you. In fact, I'm going to go further and I'm going to say that you should redirect your emotional energy into feeling pity for all the great colleges that are going to admit you only to have you reject them. You're going to make those admissions people sad. They deserve your pity. You need to feel sorry for them. So that's something that you may not hear elsewhere, but that's true. There's one more piece to the puzzle, and that's where you should focus your attention in the fall of your senior year. That boils down to 
you want to worry about the right things and not the wrong things. So what are the right things to worry about? What you want in a college and why you want it. What are your goals for your undergraduate education? And which colleges are the best fits to those goals? So these questions are about you first and about them second. So we talk about academic fit, we talk about cultural fit, we talk about financial fit. All of those are important. Um, the third one is something that, you know, maybe your parents are worried about more than you, but the fact is that to graduate debt-free is a reasonable goal that a lot of people unfortunately can't do. They wish. Um, sorry, let me get back to where I want to go. Okay. So financial fit is important because college is expensive and some are five times more expensive than others. And graduating with a big debt would be uh, something that you'd have to worry about in the future. You'd have to perhaps take a job that paid more that you liked less just because you had this debt. So um, financial fit is important too. So in conclusion, you will get into a good college. It will, you'll get a great under, undergraduate education and therefore enough said, no worries. You can move on to other things to worry about. And uh, most of you are already confident, so that's good. Those of you who are not, and I'm, I'm sure you're convinced now that you are gonna be fine, right? Well, maybe not. Um, maybe there are some skeptics. Um, maybe there are people who don't accept an argument from authority that they need some kind of data, some kind of evidence so well, we'll try the argument by anecdote. That's a good one. So I got an email last year. I guess I get these every year. Uh, when you told us that we would be fine, uh, I thought it applied to everyone but me. And then later I hear, geez, you know, I did get into my best college, my favorite college. In fact, this particular person told me in this email that she'd chosen Columbia and then emailed me again in June saying she changed her mind and picked Stanford. And you know, that made the people at Columbia pretty sad. That's something that you need to, you need to think about. But the fact is that she got into good colleges just like the rest of you. So now that we've had the uh, argument by anecdote and the argument by authority, now you're convinced, right? Oh, well, maybe not. Uh, maybe you're a scientist. Okay, fine. I have actual evidence. I have three kinds of evidence to convince you, persuade you, prove to you that you're going to be fine. All right. What is my evidence? First, you applied to SSP and you got admitted. By deciding to apply to and enroll at the summer science program this summer, you showed, you proved that you are not afraid of a hard challenge and you're seeking them, in fact. The fact that you admitted, you, that was not your choice, that was our choice, that showed that your talent and motivation came through on your application. The fact is our process is very similar to that of a selective college and our admission rate, 10% or about, is lower than most of them. Right. So this is a slide of the number of applications since um, 2000 and the uh, highest bar st starting in 2014 here is the number of people who registered online to apply. And then the green bar is the people who completed that long online form. You remember that one? And then the uh, Red bar is the number of people who completed the entire application with the teacher recommendations and the transcript and the essays and everything. And then the little tiny bar down here, the blue one, is the people who were admitted and enrolled. That's you. So you are already, you know, you, you've shown the capacity to, the willingness and the capacity to be admitted to a good college because SSP is like that. 
The second reason that uh, I have for you is that going to SSP itself, the experience, makes you a better college applicant in several ways. Number one, you learn life skills like self-discipline, like how to admit you don't know, how to admit you don't understand, how to ask for help of your peers, of your faculty, how to overcome steep challenges, how to do something that seems impossible at first, how to succeed in a, a educational situation where you're not being spoon fed, you know, recipes and say, here's the equation. Now you plug in the numbers. You deal with a lot of that, all of that at SSP and the fact that you're doing it makes you a good bet for the college that you'll do that at college too. And the college admissions people know this. The second way that the experience itself helps you be a better college applicant is that it helps you understand yourself better, your own strengths and weaknesses, your own educational and career goals, so that when you apply to any college, you can better articulate in your application why you want to go there, why you're applying to that college, and what you want to do when you get there. And that makes you a better applicant than the high school student that is really has no clue about what they want or why. That makes your application stand out. And there's even a another way you can benefit from this from SSP, and that's the SSP Connect mentoring opportunity, which will open up to you once the program is over. You'll be able to have a one-on-one -on -one mentorship with a current, either current or recent uh, undergraduate who is an SSP alum who is going to be willing to work with you, talk to you like once a week through the fall as you go through your college application process and advise you and help you uh, with that. So that's called SSP Connect and you'll hear more about that later on after SSP is, is winding down. And you can even tap the worldwide SSP network of alumni for answers and support. You can find alumni, SSP alumni from who also then attended most colleges. So um, SSP alumni do get into good colleges and maybe you'd like to see where. So we can show that too. Let's see, I need to change then my uh, in Zoom which screen I'm sharing. I think I probably have to turn off sharing and turn back on, right? That makes sense. So let me try that. Okay. Do you see this spreadsheet now? Yes. Okay. This is last year's alumni uh, who applied to college and got into some and chose one. You can only choose one, right? Um, and this is a list of those which we compiled this spring and summer. And you can see that uh, some of these folks applied to a lot of schools and uh, one might argue too many, like what's the point? Is it for bragging rights at your high school? I got into 10 colleges. Well, you know, nobody's really gonna care uh, after you graduate from high school, how many colleges you got into. It doesn't really matter, but um, so I suggest maybe a more selective uh, uh, narrow down how many you apply to, but that's a suggestion. Um, so yeah, uh, we have people who got into um, Ivy League schools and Caltech and, you know, it's uh, it's not a bad list. Cornell's my alma mater. I recommend it. Um, a few people got into Harvard and and decided to go there and other schools and Johns Hopkins, and a couple that got into MIT, and a couple more, and then a couple more, and then a couple more, a couple more decided to go there, yeah. Um, Penn, Princeton, and so forth. And this doesn't mean that uh, you're going to get into every college you apply to, because hardly anybody does, but you'll get into somewhere that's good, and you'll go there and you'll be happy. So, go back to the slides. Uh, 
Okay. Yeah, SSP alumni get into pretty good colleges. So I think you've seen that. So in conclusion, your job is to relax and introspect and you'll be fine. Um, you know, one reason that you, you might be not, not admitted to a school, keep in mind, is that those admissions people don't know you. They don't know anyone who applies. They, they don't admit or reject applica uh, applicants. They admit or reject applications, you know, files, right? So they can't judge you. They're in no position to judge you as a human being. They don't know you. They only see your application and thousands of others, right? So don't take it personally. Try not to take it personally if you're not admitted to someplace because, you know, at some point it's it's very subjective and it's it's re really random in it you know it, in some ways. So, uh, so relax, introspect uh, until you can describe in your essays what you want your college to be like and why. So then apply to several who are like that and explain to them why that is. Uh, you will get into a good college where you will get a good undergraduate education and you'll love it and you'll make friends and you'll think it's the best college in the world and you'll cheer for their, for their team. So that's my advice. I do have a little uh, reading assignment, which you can do when you get a chance. Here's a book called Where You Go Is Not Who You'll Be, An Antidote to the College Admissions Mania. That is recommended. For your parents who may be watching today, I recommend Crazy You. One dad's crash course in gutting his kid into college. It's a, a very humorous uh, look at the process. And one more for the parents, Letting Go, A Parent's Guide to Understanding the College Years. So with that, I will turn it back over to Susan for the next part of our presentation. Okay. I think we have up now our off admissions officers. Let me see if Amy has um, an intro she'd like to say. Amy, do we want to um, have a specific order? Um, no, I think we can just go ahead. Um, whatever order I listed them in, let's see, I put, I just happened to put um, Peter Osgood from Harvey Mudd College first, and then second, we'll hear from Chris Peterson from MIT. So Peter, do you want to go ahead? Absolutely. Uh, is it, do you want me to do a share screen as well? I've got a quick little PowerPoint to, to make available. Yeah, Susan, sure. can you, is that, is everyone? That's possible. Share? Yeah, okay. everyone's allowed to share. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay. So I hope this comes through for you all. Is that kind of, kind of head nod? Good. Okay. Yes. So I put my contact information here. I'm going to try and do this quickly for you. Uh, I'll hit sort of the highlights about us. We're in Southern California, which is an attractive place to live and, and uh, all kinds of opportunities. We're about an hour from the ocean. We're about 45 minutes from the biggest people trap built by a mouse, Disneyland. We're about an hour and a half from the Palm Springs in the desert. These mountains that you see on the right side are directly behind us. They're about 3,000 meter mountains. We're in Claremont here in the red square, about 50 kilometers from downtown Los Angeles. Uh, if you were to come to visit us, we hope you will. Uh, the closest airport is only about uh, 15 kilometers away, uh, Ontario Airport, which is much more convenient to fast growing airport. Um, we're part of a consortium of colleges. That's one of the things that really makes us unusual. This is a picture of the valley. And you can see these Hacienda tile roofs. And this is, these are all part of the Claremont Colleges. And we're on the northern edge of it. These colleges, there are five undergraduate colleges and two graduate schools in this consortium. Think of kind of roughly modeled after the Oxford and Cambridge systems in England. Think of 
uh, as if you had a cousin who lived a couple houses down, you can go to your cousin's house, have meals there, play with their toys. They can play with yours, celebrate your uh, birthday with you. But each, each place has its own set of rules and its own environment. So it's really a family of colleges that are literally across the street from each other. The distance from this location at Harvey Mudd College to Pitzer is about 80 seconds. And to Scripps, about 90 and about um, to Pomona College, maybe seven minutes, something like that. So there are some shared resources uh, that we, we all use, but the way we probably cooperate the most is that students at one college can take courses at the others. And so for those of you who really love math and science, you might be intrigued to know that within this group, we offer 140 math courses, which is an awful lot for a tiny college because we only have 900 students. So that's what the other virtue of our campus, and this is something that you'll have to sort out whether this is appealing to you. We're one of the very few schools that is really a powerhouse in STEM that is also exclusively an undergraduate institution. We have no master's, PhD programs. We have no graduate students. And so that means that all the research, all the resources of our institution to the full attention of our faculty is on you. Uh, and, and it's also a very intimate campus, very close knit. There are several things that tie us together. This mission drives us. And if there's one main takeaway, we hope it is this mission. And I'm gonna keep this up for a bit, but you can also see that embedded in this, we want students to have a very broad education within math and science rather than tunneling into a major right off the bat. Uh, in fact, a student at MUD is not allowed to select a major in their first year. So we don't select students by major and you're not choosing a major till the, really the when you're required to is the end of your second year, which is typical of many liberal arts colleges. We just happen to be liberal arts with a huge STEM emphasis. The impact piece is also very important to us. We insist that all students understand uh, that there's a bigger world out there that science can be used for uh, unintended and uh, uh, unintended ways that can impact people adversely. It's a diverse student body. This first year class that's entering is exactly 50-50 male and female. It's about 10% who identify as African-American, about 20, 25% that identify Latinx. It's about 8% international, but it's very small and uh, eight to one student to faculty ratio. I'm gonna skip over the academic program, but we have a common core. We require a certain set of courses in humanities, social sciences, and the arts. This is the range of courses that you could take. Uh, you could design your own, but these are courses that you would take both at MUD and at our neighboring colleges in Claremont. The majors are 10. We have some combination majors. All the majors are very broad based you'll see one major in biology rather than a distinct major in say molecular biology, different from a marine biology major. Same thing happens in engineering. So it's very broad based and that puts a lot of pressure on us to offer a lot of high-end courses, which we do, and that we put a very heavy emphasis on research opportunities. So you are going to be required to do research at our school as a capstone experience, either a senior thesis or a, an unusual program, a unique program called Clinic, in which we have sponsored research and development problems. Students work in teams of five or six to solve problems for these various companies. And we make typically eight to 15 patent disclosures every year based on our students' work. I'm gonna skip ahead a bit here. We do very well in preparing you for your next step. Uh, we send students to PhD at a really high rate. We, our, our graduates are paid well, but the people make our place special. This is, if there is a second big takeaway beyond our mission, I hope it is that we're super collaborative. One of our faculty describes us as the geek Marines. Don't leave anyone behind. To further support this, the first term is passed. No credit, you're not graded. Um, but I think by virtue of being at SSP, You've had a, a real experience to grow, to be stretched intellectually, but to make new friends and to work with them. And that's a key highlight of your experience at MUD. It's something that you will find replicated many, many times. And uh, you would, the, the, the kind of 
growth as a person, as, a, as part of a cohort of helping other people when they get stuck and, and other people helping you when you get stuck is just ingrained into our community. Part of that is supported by the fact that we're a small enough campus that can't, you can only go east or west on our campus, that the students are governed by an honor code, the common core curriculum that all students complete is a unifying piece. All the students can giggle about references to Schrodinger's cat. They all get it. Um, if you're eager for Greek life, you'll have to be content with math and physics because that's where you'll see deltas and epsilons and sigmas and gammas and lambdas. We don't put those symbols onto buildings. We intentionally put first year students into each of the nine residence halls and we then surround them with peer academic leaders mentors, proctors, it's very hard to slip through the cracks and people are actively supporting you, particularly in your first year. I think this is an unusual college where the older students reach, reach to the first year students and help them along their way. Uh, and I mentioned it's very diverse. There's a lot of support networks that we have embedded. Some of them are formal, some of them are informal, some of them are student to student. Uh, academic, uh, the application process, this is something that's, I think, kind of interesting to point out here uh, where my uh, cursor is. Uh, this was a test optional situation this last year. It will be again for students applying this year. Nearly an identical proportion of students who did not report test scores to us were also admitted. So our selection process is focused more on fit and culture, your attitudes towards learning, your attitudes towards other people more than some reckoning of your, of your record. There are some of you that may go, to, may go to schools where students would take AP lunch if they could, just to get their GPA and IOTA higher. That is not going to be a, a way to improve your application significantly. We're far more interested in you intellectually, your engagement with the material, with your, with your peers, and how you'll fit with our, our campus. We are need blind in our admission process for any US citizen permit resident. Not so for international students. International students who need funding are in a very difficult position, uh, but I think we have a very good uh, financial aid program. I like that our default rate on student loans and we do offer student loans is zero. It's a nice round flat number. And we augment our need-based aid with several families of merit scholarships, most of which you actually can't apply for. We just throw them at you and anticip anticipate that you'll like that and hope to come to, to MUD. So there are all kinds of ways to engage us. We're a really, really interesting college. Clearly not for everyone. We're not a, a typical liberal arts college. We're not a typical STEM school. We're our own place and we're driven by that mission. So with that, I'm gonna stop the share. I've probably gone over, over my time. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you and look forward to your questions. Great. I think we will reserve the Q&A for the end of the session. And for participants, if you'd like to ask a question to either Peter or Chris, you can raise your hand. We're just going to have it done live. I think that'll be the easiest way to go. And, and I'll just alternate between IU and Purdue campuses. So up next is Chris Peterson from MIT. Everybody, it's good to speak with you today. Um, I have been uh, speaking virtually or in person at SSP for many years now. Um, although I wish I could have all met you at one of the campuses, uh, Zoom uh, SSP will have to do. Um, I don't have a presentation, um, but I just want to hit a couple of points. And if you want to see the MIT slideshow, um, you can uh, go to mitadmissions.org and sign up for one of our um, virtual information sessions in course. Um, or if you want to come visit us on campus, I'll give you the insider tip that MIT is quietly hoping to welcome visitors back to campus on September 7th, assuming all goes well um, with the uh, pandemic, fingers crossed, knocking firmly on wood. Um, so the, the brief MIT TLDR that I will give you is that we are um, you know, a science and engineering um, school uh, with a strong liberal arts program as well as um, architecture and planning program. Uh, administratively, we are divided into a school of engineering, a school of science and math, a school of humanities, arts and social sciences, which is where I did my grad school and occasionally teach. Um, the oldest school of, of architecture and planning uh, in the country and a school of business, management science, as they prefer it to be called, um, as well as a college of computing that coordinates computing activities. But the what of MIT is I think less important than the why. 
Um, we are one of the relatively small number of uh, privately operated land grant universities, um, which means that we were chartered uh, in the public interest in order to um, serve the nation and the world um, in now the 21st century. Um, and I think that the thing that everybody who, that is common to everybody at MIT, no matter what their major, no matter what their field of interest, um, no matter um, you know, what they hope to do with their careers is an intense interest in problem solving. Um, the, the sort of um, moth to the flame. If you've ever seen the XKCD nerd snipe comic, the one where it's like you, you might like math on the chalkboard and then like some dork is like helplessly entranced and then they can't like ever look away from the chalkboard and it just causes traffic jams in the school hallway. You know, MIT really is that kind of um, environment for better or for worse in terms of hallway traffic. Um, and I think that the problem solving practical orientation of most of the students is one of the things that really binds um, people together. Again, no matter what they're, where they're coming from or what they're in through. Um, I would also say that the desire, um, and, and this is something that is really isomorphic with SSP. And one reason why I think so many SSP alumni feel attracted to MIT is, is the intensity. Um, the, the desire to seek out a rigorous education for its own sake, because they see that rigor as its own reward. Um, I think the big, um, counterbalancing weight at MIT in the, as, the, as of this August, the 12 years that I will have been in the admissions office, um, is um, this balance between the desire to make MIT as rigorous and therefore as you know, challenging and rewarding as possible and as humane as possible. Um, and I think one of the things that I'm um, really proud of are all of the students and the faculty and the staff who have worked together um, to institute a set of policies and cultural practices um, that destigmatize the fear of failure or the experience of struggling, while also praising the process of a growth, a, a process of struggling and the pursuit of a growth-oriented mindset, um, and setting up, you know, elaborate support systems in order to make sure. Um, that students uh, not only um, survive, but thrive at the Institute. And I do think it's a qualitative difference from um, the MIT of the 1950s, 1960s, where the sort of motto of tech is hell was shouted aloud by students with gusto. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that I, I, I think is interesting, you know, there's a lot of different things that you can sort of look up. We have some things that are similar to Harvey, to Harvey Mudd, um, and there are some things that we are different, as, as Peter said, Harvey Mudd, which is, by the way, if you've never visited the Claremont Colleges, it, it really is, I love the, the overview shot of the Hacienda Roofs, it's a beautiful place. Um, and I think one of the things that is in, so interesting to me whenever I do one of these talks with my colleagues is you can see the similarities, you know, research opportunities, um, you know, uh, in our cases, um, you know, a, a pass, kind of no record, first year semester, not choosing a course uh, major until the end of your first year, not incorporating that in the admissions decisions and the differences, right? We have grad, we have grad students. Um, we have um, uh, slightly more majors, but not as an extensive as a consortium system. Um, we, we also have first year required housing, but we have slightly different, you know, houses and, and styles of things. The thing that I really want to impress upon you um, is, you know, you're all drawn to SSP because of your um, um, interest in, in, in learning stuff, in research, in, um, in, in cramming more things into your brain. And I, I think that um, one of the most productive ways to metabolize the college admissions anxiety is to, um, rather than just sit there and soak in it, um, like a horrible bath, um, to try to actually um, make a record of all the different things that you think are comparatively useful um, across the different schools and to zone in on the specific characteristics of particular educational models that intrigue you and, and might attract you. Um, I'll give you one example. Um, so, you know, lots of different schools have different policies in terms of honor societies, class rank, 
um, um, or uh, you know how the GPA system works or whether or not you get magna or summa cum laude. MIT has none of those things. We have no class rank. There's no Latin honor societies. There's no special distinctions on your diploma. Nobody's the valedictorian of MIT. And those are all specific design choices that we made to try to reduce intra-student competition. Because if you don't know, if there's no rank, force ranked ordering of the students against each other, you know, you, you reduce some of that um, um, need to compete. Or we have this really stupidly late drop date. Um, if you sign up for your classes in early September, you don't have to decide to drop a class that you're in until uh, the 10 weeks into a 14 week term. It's, it's around Thanksgiving break. And the really nice thing about this, right, is that, you know, you can sign up for a class, an extra class, a class in a field you've never studied, a grad school class as an undergrad. And if you, if it's just outside of your league, then you can give yourself two thirds of the term to really test yourself to try it. And then you drop it and it doesn't even appear in your transcript. And that's every year you're in college. And other schools have much more restrictive drop dates, right? They're sort of like, nope, you got to make a decision. We're moving you along. And I think that even though these um, aspects of, of institutional infrastructure, they don't seem as cultural as things like the school colors or the mascot or, I don't know, the big game, whatever it is that people do when they think of culture, right? You think of, of what people do and that is culture. But material conditions and administrative policies generate culture too. And that's something that I hope you can take away from this is that it's really hard when, you're, when, when it's COVID and you can't just go like easily hang out at a lot of colleges unencumbered in dorms um, to get a sense of what culture is like but at least you can look at these specific things and think what kind of culture might be generated by these policies and what part of that am I the most interested in and drawn to? Um, so if you can do your little, um, you know, uh, materialist base giving rise to the ideological superstructure um, uh, analysis of, of college admissions, I think that it's one of the things you can do with your time. You know, as, as Richard said, don't get too focused on it. Don't get too stressed out about it. But it is something that I always try to impart on pe upon people that it's like super important to look into when they try to get a sense of whether or not they would be a good fit. And the last thing that I would say is, um, you know, Richard, you know, showed that chart of all the great schools that people get into. But the biggest thing that I want to impart on you before we go into Q&A, and, and I'm sure we'll talk about it more then, is, there's no such thing as schools that are objectively better or worse than other schools. College ranking books are an expensive lie and a racketeering scheme to sell copies of the US News or World Report. Um, the most important thing that you can do is find a school whose cultural and educational attributes will bring the most out of you as a student and develop you most as a human in the directions that you want to be developed in both of those vectors. And so to the extent that you can do that research and you can hone in on those things, you're going to be advantaging yourself in the college search much more than simply optimizing for prestige or you know, the, the fanciest kind of campus or what school colors bring out your eyes or any of these other um, more superficial characteristics. Okay, that's my spiel. Terrific. Okay, thanks to both Peter and Chris for that insight. And for the next 15 minutes or so, the SSP TAs are going to talk about their experience applying to colleges, choosing one, making the transition from home to university life, and then choosing a major and maybe a bunch of other things. So I will let the SSP TAs Go now. Does someone want to volunteer? Lainey, do you want to go first since you've seen this before? Yeah, sure, I'll go first. Also, I don't know if PD left already, but hello, P. Um, he knows me quite well. Uh, okay, so, right, I'm Lainey. I'm one of the TAs at Purdue. And right now I'm a rising senior. Um, a rising senior at MIT. This is my door behind me, is my background. So 
I grew up in Hawaii. I went to a public high school on one of the outer islands. Uh, it wasn't like a huge school. It wasn't like an MIT theater school or anything like that. Um, I guess I didn't know where I wanted to go in freshman or sophomore year or junior year. Um, I just thought, you know, I kind of want to go somewhere prestigious. That'd be cool. Um, didn't really know where. Um, my mom really pushed me to go to Stanford. She was like, let's, let's build up the Stanford dream, okay? Let's go, you know, cream of the crop and also on the West Coast so I can come visit you. Uh, please don't move all the way to the East Coast because that's a really long flight. Um, that Pacific Ocean really makes it difficult. Um, and then I came to SSP. Uh, I was uh, one of the kids that like the admission day, the email I got telling me that I got into SSP was not the celebration day. The celebration day was when I got the financial aid email. Uh, so SSP's financial aid is the only reason I was able to go and get that experience. So it was really cool. Um, and that was when I first started thinking about other schools and thinking, okay, maybe I actually do have a chance at some of the higher level schools. Um, <laughs> I remember laughing uh, respectfully at Richard's speech when he told us all that we can get into good colleges and that <laughs> we are good students. Um, but you know, now I see like, he told the truth 100%, 100%. Um, so after I left SSP, I spent a lot of time applying to colleges, made a huge list, you know, like a really obsessive master list of like over 10 colleges. And I was like, this is where I'm going to apply. Um, I ended up actually only applying to three. So I did QuestBridge. I don't know if anyone knows what that is. It's a program for lower income kids and you can get matched with different colleges. So, um, I went through the QuestBridge process and I matched with MIT actually. And I get like, you get really early decisions with QuestBridge. So um, I actually decided pretty early that MIT was the place for me once I started talking to everyone. Um, but it certainly wasn't easy, um, especially for my mom. She like took me on a trip to New York in January to say like, do you really wanna go here? you see the snow and how cold it is? You would hate this so much. Didn't work. Um, anyway, after all of that, you know, I went through the entire process, committed to MIT, and it was a very fun transition, I will say. But I got to see all my other SSP classmates go all over the place. I think six joined me at MIT, a bunch went to Stanford and BU and uh, Harvard and Northeastern and you name it, like, a whole bunch of places and it's even though we all like we're at the same place and we all have the same mindset we all fit in so well at all these different colleges like it doesn't really matter where you end up in my opinion um I personally like I think my personality matches really well at the college that I went to um which eventually is why I chose it and everything kind of just fit into place after that um I'm really having a great time at college and I am scared to go next year, but I think it'll be great anyway. So that's kind of my spiel about my high school to college transition. So I don't know if another TA wants to go now. Great, how about Colin? And then Molly can follow up. We're not hearing you on your fancy mic, Colin, but you are unmuted. <laughs> Colin's got the best mic set up here, particularly for our upcoming talent show. No. Now. There we go. Now okay. it's working. Aha. Um, okay. So my admissions experience is probably like nothing you guys are going to experience because you guys are ridiculously smart and you know these awesome stellar applications um i'm currently a, uh, at purdue i'm a purdue ta um studying biochemistry 
and um <laughs> my admissions process was uh limited to say the least because i did it for financial reasons and also for just the fact that suddenly i had to decide sometime in high school that i was going to be academically successful and so i had i was kind of behind everybody else in terms of um having building up those kinds of experiences and the types of classes that you'd take and and whatever to kind of get into that mindset of being academically successful um so i only applied to three colleges <laughs> i applied to purdue i applied to iu and i also applied to Cornell as kind of a joke because I, I wanted to go there because I wanted to go to vet school and I was like this will be funny I know I'm not going to get accepted but it's only like 50 bucks whatever um so, <laughs> so that was that was a fun one um but Purdue was where I really wanted to go because Purdue had the vet school I really wanted to go to vet school um I figured I would go to Purdue for an undergraduate degree um I applied to IU and Purdue I got rejected from Cornell because obviously um with my stance uh then iu i got in instantly and then plot twist i did not get into purdue the first time around um i got rejected um i applied under biology in the college of science for uh and when we reached out uh to purdue and the admissions officers they were like yo 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 if you want to go to vet school why are you applying under biology in the college of science you should apply in like biochemistry in college of ag or animal sciences. And I looked at those two options. I did it. I appealed my application. I changed my major option to biochemistry and I got it instantly um, after that. And like, I, <laughs> it was, it was a very heart wrenching experience. Cause it's not like I, you like, like similar to what um, Chris uh, uh, said, it's not that I use a bad school. It's that it isn't, what I wanted for my goals, you know, like IU is really good at very at thing at a lot of things, but not the things that they they don't focus on the things that I wanted to do, um, like Purdue did. So I was like, it was a heart wrenching experience, and I was like, I was like sitting there my senior year, just like in the hallway, like, oh no, what am I gonna do, you know, before I got accepted into Purdue under biochemistry, and I show up on the I show up on the first day. Uh, it was this was a this was a funny experience i showed up on the on the first day uh the star day during the summer or whatever they called it um and i talked about uh, or i met with uh one of the uh, faculty and they they went over my classes and stuff like that and they uh and he asked he's like hey i see you applied originally under the college of bio uh, in biology under the college of science do you want to switch to biology and i just was like wait what i was like i can just switch now that i'm in and apparently yes that's the case but because i do mo a majority of things out of, in my life out of spite i said no which is the best spiteful decision that i've made in like out of a lot of the spiteful decisions that i've made because it's been awesome. Like, I, I feel like I, I kind of, I got lucky in that I just kind of accidentally fell into this really cool uh, major and I fell into this really cool uh, um, community, honestly. Like, I just, I do not regret joining biochemistry at all. Uh, and I never, I've never wanted to switch. It just was like, oh, wow, this is exactly what I needed. <laughs> and I just kind of fell into it um, because it was just, limited options but it ended up like working out really well for me uh um i don't foresee that you guys are going to have any of those problems but i it's still cool to share my story um and also a cool thing to put in there too like maybe if you really 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 want to go to a place maybe a, a uh an appeal application might not uh not, might not be the worst thing ever uh <laughs> if you if you don't if you don't get it for some reason um you know yeah that's that's my story it's yeah <laughs> Awesome, thanks. Molly, you're up. Alrighty. Hi everyone, my name is Molly Spikowski. I am a rising senior at Boston University. I am studying biochemistry and molecular biology and I'm also on a pre-med track. I went to SSP back in 2017 with Lainey and we were one of the first biochemistry programs. Um, I attended a very small private high school in New Jersey and while I definitely had a lot of extracurricular opportunities and research and things like that. I think SSP was, as we 
you know, advertise it to be a really once in a lifetime experience in terms of it really opened my eyes to both the rigor and frustration of science, but it also made me really fall in love with it. And clearly it influenced my major choice as I am studying biochemistry. Um, but it also really opened my eyes to the level, level of collaboration and rigor I wanted out of my peers. And I think like all of you or most of you, college is kind of always a thought in the back of your head. And SSP kind of really, as Lainey said, altered that perspective in terms of what kinds of schools I should be applying to, what kind of programs I'm looking into. And the level of STEM definitely influenced the types of schools I wanted to. I definitely wanted a research institution. Um, I wanted schools that likely had a connected medical school and SSP kind of really helped me change that perspective because I now was able to hone in what I wanted because there is such a vast list of schools out there that are phenomenal, but they're also all unique and they're phenomenal for different reasons. And again, the community that I got at SSP was something I knew I would never be able to mirror anywhere else, but it was something I would like to try and construct somewhere else. Um, so, very similar to Lainey, I also constructed a master list of absolutely everything, what programs they had, and I know not the best, but what were they ranked, and how many research opportunities were students offered, and faculty and student ratios, and I wanted everything in front of me before I even tried to make a decision. And as great as that is, if you're given the opportunity, nothing matches going to campuses, talking to current students. And that was one of the most invaluable things that I was able to do. And I know it may be a little difficult with Zoom, but you have an amazing community in front of you. Reach out to alumni, reach out to us. We love talking to you. Um, but as I said, I kind of made this huge list. I did apply to a lot of schools. And at the end of the day, I did choose Boston University, uh, primarily because again, very research focused. It was a very big school and Boston was the perfect location for me in terms of, I knew I wanted to go into medicine or research or something STEM and Boston is a phenomenal place to do that. It is a great city. It has a lot of college students, which makes it an amazing community to be in. And I'm gonna be honest, I didn't love my decision at first, but I did fall in love with it as I went through it. Um, I think it's a phenomenal school. I love the people that are in my program and in my extracurriculars. And I think you can make a community out of anything that you fall into. And SSP is key in that in terms of, you know, finding people to talk to about the process. And just, I guess, a little side note, I think the people that really got me through the application process the most was my SSP community. So you have some great people around you. Take advantage of it. And that's pretty much my story. Thank you guys. Wonderful. Great. We are going to open it up now for participant Q&A. And how this is going to work is that if you could use the raise hand function on the Zoom toolbar, you can ask a question of Peter Osgood of Harvey Mudd College or Chris Peterson of MIT and Mr. Bowden and the other TAs will also chime in. So um, go ahead and uh, raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. Okay. All right, Anusha. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Peterson. Um, okay. So uh, I'm from Pakistan. Um, I identify as a practicing Muslim. And so, you know, diversity at schools, it means a lot to me uh, since my religion is pretty strict in terms of what we need and what we don't need. Um, my question and my question, I have like two parts to my question. Uh, the first is in regards to my nationality. So how do you, since it, I'm from a third world country, it is very hard for us to get a lot of the opportunities that, you know, kids from America or the States or Canada get. And so how does MIT maintain a fair threshold in terms of judging the students and judging their you know, extracurricular activities and all the things that they get? And the second part is, if, for example, you know, a student is you know, from like a community of people that have a lot of you know, requirements in terms of religion, how do you make those students feel at home? 
Sure, they're both great questions, and I'll try to tie them together in the answer. Um, so for the first part, I think what we, you know, we talk a lot on our website about practicing what we call holistic or contextual admissions. And the way that I think about this is that we don't evaluate students based on what they have um, done. We evaluate students based on what they have done relative to what we would have expected them to do given their resources and opportunities. And the reason that we think that is good is because in our view, coming to MIT with its incredible resources, support infrastructure, tutoring, research funding and everything else is, I mean, um, nothing is an equalizer, but it significantly levels the playing field for all of our students. And so if we can pick the students who have the underlying initiative, drive, creativity, desire to make use of their resources and everything else, um, then they will find great things to do with the MIT resources. And we know that that is going to change around the country and around the world. Um, and that's just basically what professional admissions is in, in our office, is learning to evaluate um, people in their context. To your question about um, multiculturalism, pluralism, making people from um, different places feel at home, um, I would say that in general, one of the things that was so transformative for me about coming to MIT to work and eventually be a grad student as, as a um, cishet white dude who grew up in rural Vermont, New Hampshire, um, was that it was the, and remains, the most um, diverse community that I've ever been a part of. Um, there is no majority race or ethnicity at MIT. Um, and uh, the last time I looked at the numbers, which admittedly was a couple of years ago, I mean, this isn't a number that we publish. Um, I believe it is around 75% of students are either immigrants to the United States or the child of at least one immigrant. Um, so the majority of MIT students are closely connected to the immigrant experience, the new American experience or something else like that. And, and that actually ends up being up and up and that's true across race and ethnicities. Um, I, I think that um, one of the thing that things that binds MIT students together is that there is an aspect of newness to everyone who is there, because even if you are someone like me and a, a white dude who is intergenerationally from the United States, um, the, the experience of being in such a diverse and pluralistic community is itself sometimes new to you. Um, and that I, there's a, there's a um, the, the, the MacArthur um, Genius Grant author and academic, uh, Tressie McMillan Cotton um, has, a, has a phrase about, um, I think she's talking about democracy and she says the, the, the ideal pluralistic democracy is one where everybody is a little bit uncomfortable because everybody is constantly in this productive tension. And that's a, that's a long general answer. But the specific answer that I, would, that I would give is there are a ton of student cultural affinity groups um, to help draw together these subsets. So whether it's part of an, an African, South Asian, Muslim, all these different aspects of identity, um, affinity groups that students create and run on their own um, that um, uh, are, are the things that students, when they want to feel some commonality, when they want to, um, when, they, when they need to um, embrace what is similar and, and grounding to them as opposed to all this troublesome newness um, that, that helps them grow and is complicated in, in, in that newness. Um, they can they can find a safe harbor in these affinity communities that help them negotiate and navigate and find a sense of home. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Anushe, why don't you go next? I'm sorry, Ananya. Um, hi. Uh, so my question is for Mr. Peterson. Um, so it's, how do you think the colors of cardinal red and steel gray symbolize MIT? That is a question I have never gotten in the 12 years I've been working in the admissions office. Um, um, 
I don't know if how, how the colors were chosen or why. M see Laney's repping them right now. I don't know why MIT and Cornell and Harvard and um, Stanford and a bunch of other schools all have this red crimson shade and then it makes it very difficult to brand anything that's distinguishing. Um, I'm gonna pivot your question about the MIT mascot, which is uh, the beaver, nature's engineer, um, which is hardworking uh, and industrious and does its best work late at night. Um, because I think that's something that was actually intentionally chosen um, to uh, uh, represent the MIT culture. You, you've given me an interesting question. I'm gonna ask the MIT historian if there was any choice about that went into the, the MIT red and steel gray, um, or if they were just like, uh, we're out of ideas, let's knock off Harvard, it's down the road. All right. I think we're gonna have Alor go. Alor, can you ask your question now? Uh, hi, yeah, I just had a question for Mr. Peterson as well. So I know that MIT also has like a media studies major and a lot of offerings in the humanities. So I just, I guess wanted to ask you how feasible do you think it would be for a student to study something like say chemistry or biochemistry alongside something like media studies or something like that? Right, so I don't know if you specifically teed me up for that because I did my grad school in CMS and that's the, the comparative media studies program and that's the department in which I teach, um, but good job. Um, so what I would say is um, we have a similar structure to what Peter described in detail at Harvey Mudd where there's this sort of um, um, core curriculum, what we call our general institute requirements. Um, and then every student concentrates in the humanities, arts, and social sciences. Um, and so our media studies program is one of the most common concentrations because, you know, you can take like four classes in video games and be like, I've got my concentration done now. I'm really into Bloodborne. Um, but um, the, uh, that made Colin happy. Colin, that was for you. Um, with your uh, podcaster mic. Um, so... Uh, in terms of combining majors, there's sort of two ways that you can do that kind of study. Well, there's three. One of them is double majoring, but actually relatively few people double major because it adds a lot more administrative overhead without a ton of um, benefit. The other thing is that at MIT, there's what's called a joint major, of course, 21S or 21E, um, which is where you can combine any engineering um, field that you like or any science field that you like with any humanities, arts, and social science field that you like. Um, and so you can just mix and match those two things. And then you graduate with one joint degree in humanities and engineering or humanities and science. Um, and it sort of just, it, it, it knocks out more of the requirements and, and administrative paperwork in one um, degree that you tailor to your own interests. Um, there is also, although it doesn't involve media studies, there are also an increasing number of intentionally designed joint majors. So you can major in, um, um, there's this kind of like computer science, data science major, course 6-14, which is course six computer science with 14 economics. Um, but um, the, the main thing that I would tell you, and this is just to generalize it from MIT, because I think that's one of the things that I try to do here, is, um, how can I say this? A lot of students in high school, ambitious, smart, hardworking students at programs like MIT, at, at like SSP, um, ask me questions about double majoring. Um, and you might ask yourself the question of why do I want a double major? Do I want a double major because there's specific things that I want to learn that span two different disciplines or fields as they're structured within the academy? Or do I want a double major because it appeals to my ambitions and sounds cool? Um, and it can be both of those things, but you should ask yourself, what are the driving motivations and what are the most important things? Because there may, no matter what college you attend, be several paths to achieving either of those things. And particularly on the learning what you want to learn to be able to solve problems side, it may be that a double major is not um, the most, um, like it's the most credentialed path, but it's not the most effective path 
to learning the things that you want to learn and disciplining yourself to your actual curiosities and aptitudes, as opposed to the thing with the most letters in your diploma. So that's just a thought experiment for you to engage in. I was hoping that Peter could also comment on humanities interests at Harvey Mudd College and how those are fulfilled by more STEM oriented kids who have um, um, also might want to pursue a major in the humanities. Well, similar to, to MIT, I believe, I, I'm not a product of MIT, but we require it. Uh, we don't work very well for a student who really doesn't have much enthusiasm for this. So the student who is thinking, look, I, I'm not willing to sacrifice my interest in philosophy or French literature or international affairs on the altar of science. That's a student we want. And I, I've had conversations with our faculty who actively do not want to teach really high flying STEM students who don't have an enthusiasm for areas outside of math and science. I'll just add that our founding president was a person who was a physicist who walked away from the Manhattan Project. So our, it's embedded into our culture, it's embedded into our, our, our mission that students need to understand the impact of their work uh, and from a societal and humanistic standpoint. Terrific. Our next question is gonna be from Henry C. Um, so I guess this is kind of a question for both of you. I was wondering if you guys could talk more on how most undergrads and most students in your colleges find research opportunities. Is it through specific programs in the school or is it like typically, like, I guess, like cold calling professors and seeing if they have a position open in their lab? I'll go first if that's okay. Uh, it is now a more formalized process. It had been a bit more ad hoc some years ago. But uh, basically a student, even in their first year is gonna be pretty well blasted with uh, communication about research opportunities right from the get-go. Some faculty are gonna be more assertive about finding opportunities for students. We'll go visit other sections of courses in, in their discipline. Uh, keep in mind that since we're an undergraduate institution, a smart move from a professor is to have a blend of students across different class years in the program so that the juniors and seniors are really running the lab in the professor's absence. And they, they rise quickly to the positions that are often held by graduate students elsewhere. Um, and they can help bring along the first year students and the sophomores who then a year or two or three later are in that same position of, of keeping the cycle going and instructing the newer arrivals. I would say that at MIT, it runs the range from the formal to the ad hoc. Um, we are um, you know, significantly larger um, than, than Harvey Mudd with, as we were discussing earlier, you know, grad students and, and, um, and, and faculty who you know, have a range of um, research uh, modalities. And so um, you know, that some, um, for some programs or some professors will just you know, put up a listing on a well-defined central site you might take a class and just have a lot of good conversations with one of the professors and say, hey, I'd like to actually push this area that I wrote my final paper on a little bit more. And then you co-write a research proposal together. So it, it really runs a, a pretty broad range of how people find research opportunities. And I would say that one of the nice things about that, um, one of the optimistic spins I would put on something um, um, uh, like like that is that you know there's this philosophy that one of my grad school professors at MIT told me that he thought was true about the institute, which was that it was built around creating low stairs and high ceilings, um, so that everybody had accessibility but nobody was held back. And from a research perspective, there's enough of these like I've never done research before. How do how does baby's first research project happen? Um, you know, where there's sort of these well-defined, you know, you go to this place, you look at the listings, you pick a listing. And then once you're more comfortable, you build a sense of what research is. Um, you have a better idea of how these things get started. You're more confident talking to a faculty member. You can arrange things in a little bit more of an ad hoc way. Awesome. Let's do Natasha followed by Noel. All right, I also have a question uh, for both of you. I think you touched on this earlier, um, but could you talk a little bit more about kind of how Harvey Mudd and MIT uh, prepare students specifically for careers in medicine and applying to medical school uh, through things like advising and things like that? Hmm. 
You want to go first, Peter? No. I'll let you go first. I, I went first last time. Go ahead. So. Okay. Um, um, so at MIT, uh, the way people who, we have no pre-med program, what we have is a pre-health advising office. And if you think you want to be a doctor, then you go to the pre-health advising office and you say, how do I doctor? And um, they will look at your major and they will look at your research area and they will look at various um, things that you have on your plans. And they will say, well, you're already gonna cover 85% of the pre-med curriculum through the GIRs and what you're taking in your major, but you should take this elective or two. Or, well, you know, here's um, you know, a good MCAT um, study resource or well, um, you know, here's some places that you might like to do research. Um, one of the things that is nice about MIT is that I've known lots of students who have majored in everything from biology to history, who have gone on to become physicians or uh, uh, research physicians. Um, and so um, be because being pre-med is less of a path and more of a preparatory um, system, um, students have a lot more um, flexibility um, than they might have um, at, a, at a school um, where the requirements um, for you know, the core curriculum didn't already align so much with the, with the med school preparation. From our standpoint, we also have a, uh, an advisory system for students interested in health sciences. It's a relatively small number. I think our, I would also say that our biology and chemistry programs are fairly, are, are well influenced by the quantitative skills that the students have both coming in and what they develop through our core curriculum. So it's, it's a little bit different than, from, than a classic biology major. Our students have, can get underneath some of these problems quantitatively and, and opens up some opportunities for them. We have a, a distinct major that's mathematical and computational biology for that reason. Uh, let me just add, uh, we have quite a few MDs in the uh, SSP alumni database from uh, going back decades. Uh, people studied, uh, did astrophysics at SSP and ended up in medical school. Uh, so that's not an unusual thing. And there, so there's alumni who can advise folks about that path as well. Go ahead, Noel. Okay, so I actually had two questions. Um, one question, the first one was for Mr. Peterson. So I know that MIT offers great research opportunities through programs like Europe. I think Lainey put that one in the chat and through the independent activities periods. So I was wondering, in addition to these research opportunities given on campus, if there were like nearby institutes and hospitals that MIT has relations with that undergraduate students from MIT often go to work. And um, the second question was for both Mr. Peterson and Mr. Osgood. So I noticed there are lots of fun clubs, extracurricular, and even laboratories open to students at both MIT and Harvey Mudd. For example, like I love chocolate and I love sci-fi. So I was drawn to MIT's Laboratory of Chocolate Science and Science Fiction Society. So with all these clubs and extracurriculars available to students, how have undergraduate students at MIT and Harvey Mudd described their balance of time between extracurriculars, coursework, and social events? So I'll, I'll answer the first one relatively quickly, which is that Europe is more of a funding structure than it is a limited kind of MIT academic program. Um, and so there are many students who will do a research project um, funded through and organized through the Europe program that are actually held at, for example, neighboring hospitals or, or medical um, facilities. Um, in terms of all the clubs, yes, there are hundreds of them and it's very chaotic. Um, I think that the way that most students tend to find clubs is through various activity fairs, um, through random things that get spammed to their email from clubs um, and you know, from what their friends are involved in. Um, how they tend to balance them is, um, you know, every student, frankly, finds a different balance between um, how, uh, what do they want to devote to classes and research, what do they want to devote to their friends and their clubs, and what do they want to devote to sleep. 
Um, and I think that we try to find, uh, we, we try to really encourage a healthy balance of those things, but what a healthy balance looks like for every student is, is different. Um, and so it really is just an individual um, decision that where we try to remind people that they should be attending to markers of their health and wellness. I'll say that uh, food clubs are very popular. The most popular clubs, at, at, in fact, at the college, followed closely by our most popular intramural sport, inner tube water polo. Should give that a try. We take it more seriously than we probably should. Uh, the, um, I will say that the work-life balance is something that we're constantly thinking about. And we have a lot of feedback mechanisms, faculty, students in the residence halls to make sure that people treat themselves well, that they find uh, that good life balance. Well, the, part of the complication with clubs and activities at our school is that we're neighbors to these other colleges. So there may be activities at another college that you're gonna join. And I know some students in our college have their best friends at a different college, even though they're living at MUD, right? So, and there are others who interact sparingly with their peers from other colleges. There's a lot of opportunity for it, but the, the balance that you're gonna have, I'll be, I'll be transparent here, um, our core curriculum is in transition so that it will be less demanding, have a smaller footprint on students and give them more discretionary time and more elective freedom. Thank All you. right, good, good times. How about Micah followed by Yana? Yeah, so um, part of what I've loved about SSP is we've had all these guest lectures and one similarity that they are one thing that's been shared across all the guest lectures uh, from these different scientists is they all say that scientists need to have more of a voice in public discussion and kind of have to leverage their role as a scientist to make change um, uh, both, you know, in policy and also in society. Um, in fact, one of our speakers even blamed scientists for a lot of COVID deaths for not coming out sooner, sooner and trying to preempt the um, the anti-science type of you know movement. So how both at MIT uh, and at Harvey Mudd are students prepared to also have these leadership roles and to kind of leverage what they learn uh, for the benefit of society? Great question. Um, I think uh, one of them, part of it is the communication requirement in terms of being people who can communicate science in the public interest. Um, and I would say uh, the other part of it is um, um, <laughs> um, at least in, I, in my talks to MIT students, I always try to remind them that the uh, big, comp as you were pointing out, the big complicated problems in society are neither purely social nor technical, they're fundamentally socio-technical, that it doesn't matter how good the vaccine is if you can't uh, get people to use it. Um, it doesn't matter how well you can, um, um, you know, model uh, climate change if you can't get people to implement any mitigation efforts. Um, and so understanding um, all of these different uh, things is, is uh, and, and the, um, the, the human side of them, I think that's, I don't want to, I can't speak historically for MUD, but I would guess that's why both of our institutions, despite being known for our science and tech strength, um, have humanities um, um, core curricula um, because we we see those things as being a necessary conditions for what being a meaningfully successful scientist or engineer in the world uh, entails. Uh, similarly, uh, I think the 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 venue, the vehicle for your for for the skill set is something that's woven into our academic program. A new feature of our core curriculum is a course called Impact specifically. And there are some very popular courses. I think a lot of students at our college are surprised by how much public speaking they have to do. As part, it's not a requirement, but it's just the way we build our academic program. The first time might be a little daunting by the 28th time you're salty. Uh, I would also say that the lectures, the, the clubs that are focusing on these, on the kinds of impact, get a lot of funding quickly from the institution and from the, the student body uh, offices as well. Uh, and then certainly the lectures, it seems to me that the, the majority of them have to do with questions of, of equity, uh, of impact. Those kinds of considerations are, are quite prominent on the lecture circuit, not only at MUD, but across the colleges as well. Yana, go ahead. 
Um, hi, I also have a question for both of you. So the first one was about um, the recent spotlight of the rising trend of attacks on Asian or Asian American students in America, especially in like metropolitan areas. And I was wondering what your school provides in terms of support for students who may be facing that kind of discrimination. And the second question, was, question I was wondering if it may be too specific, but if you guys know anything about your school's um, ROTC programs and for example, with MIT, how like the Naval, Military or Aerospace Science courses kind of play into the general curriculum. Thank you. I'll, I'll take a first shot at this. Um, I think th this, this last year has been a year of great uncertainty and tumult in this country. And, and, and I would also argue broader uh, outside of this country, but it has really shaken a lot of people. I have found myself questioning my own background tremendously in this last year, in this last year especially, and my frustration. Uh, so I guess what I will say is that I've, it, despite a pandemic, I have seen an incredibly attentive uh, network to help students filter some of these experiences, to have open discussions about it, faculty uh, it, it helping the students engage this in their classes, sometimes not holding the class in the traditional way to have some real conversation about this. Uh, uh, the second part of your question, uh, I think you, you'll have to look, uh, I'm sorry, help me out with the second part of the question. Um, uh, I was just wondering, because I know that uh, Harvey Mudd has a cross-town agreement with, I think, USC. Ah, uh, the Paramount ROTC, Virginia. correct, yeah. So the ROTC program is limited, to be honest with you at Mudd. Uh, the only program that, we, that, that actually functions is an Army ROTC program, and that's connected through our neighbor, Claremont McKenna College. We don't offer it ourselves. Um, I would echo everything Peter said about the difficulty of these last few years. And I think um, uh, given what I said earlier about the significant proportion of MIT students who are connected to an immigrant experience from um, many parts of the world, including um, the, the Asian continent and uh, related subcontinents, um, uh, that it has been deeply felt by uh, many of our community members. And I think also has been um, really um, galvanizing for a lot of our community um, because you know we had students who were trapped abroad when the travel ban, the initial version of the travel ban came down in 2017. And I think that there were students and faculty who had kind of not been paying that much attention to um, contemporary uh, politics and where it might lead, um, who were suddenly um, through the social proximity um, made to realize the potential effects of um, that kind of um, you know, uh, anti-immigrant uh, nativism and everything else. I mean, and this is actually something, if you look, look back in the MIT archives from the last wave of anti-immigrant hysteria um, of, of this degree in the late 1800s and early 1900s, uh, Richard McLaurin, um, who was MIT's first president from outside the United States, uh, has this great um, speech that I always go back to where he talks about the purpose of a university education at an institution like MIT is not to build walls between countries, but to build bridges, which I thought had an interesting historical echo for something that was written in 1915. I mean, from a material point, I, I want to respond to the best degree that I can to the material aspect of your question, which is, um, you know, when um, if, MIT, I think, has responded to its various, um, whether you're talking about um, Asians and Asian Americans, whether you're talking about um, Black Americans, whether um, uh, immigrants or the intergenerational descendants of slaves, whether you're talking about Native Americans with whom MIT is engaged in a reckoning of our land grant history. Um, um, I, I think that the way we've tried to deal with all of that is with our leadership working directly with students, faculty and staff who identify from those backgrounds trying to figure out what are the things that the Institute can do to materially support them. 
um, whether it's money for causes, whether it is space on campus for affinity um, communities um, and, and, and cultural um, uh, readouts, um, whether it's a beefing up access to um, universal resources like our Institute Discrimination Harassment Response Center or um, 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 you know, uh, bias uh, response centers that will um, also um, support students who are dealing with, with racial and ethnic discrimination. Um, but it is, um, you know, as, as Peter said, um, it's been a really uh, saliently tough um, several years. And I think we're doing everything we can to try to support our students. To your point on ROTC, um, I would just quickly say we have a, a large Boston-based ROTC program, as you probably know. Um, the best thing that you can do if you're interested in participating in ROTC um, is to you know apply for the various um, scholarships that exist for the, the programs um, and then be in touch with the MIT um, program officers to let them know that you've um, that you've applied for them um, it, it doesn't make you know we're, we're need blind in full need so whether or not you get the scholarship is not going to um, impact on its own your um, your application but we do try to make sure that we're supporting the military training that is actually um, required by the MIT charter uh, let me just add, uh, Susan, um, you're all in high school, and I think it's uh, fairly uh, obvious that um, any college that you're going to end up at is going to be more diverse and more welcoming of difference than the average high school. Uh, so basically, if you feel different, which everyone does more or less, some of you much more than others in high school, you're likely to have fewer challenges along those lines in college. It's going to be a more diverse and more welcoming environment, especially if you look for that cultural fit when you're applying that we talked about earlier. Wonderful. Let's go with Jack Z and Alex K. Alex, if your connection is good, I saw you dropped in, in line there. So Jack Z first, followed by Alex K. Yeah, so um, I guess my question kind of has two parts, uh, and it's for um, both uh, colleges. Um, so first, um, roughly uh, how much of the undergraduate experience is dedicated to uh, research um, in terms of like time and energy, uh, or maybe just time, um, but uh, also how much of it is dedicated to um, being civically engaged, like are there opportunities on campus to be involved in, for example, election cycles or um, talking about important public policy that also may relate to STEM? Sure. Um, I think Peter went first in the last one, um, so I'll go on this one. Um, in terms of research, it really depends on the students at MIT, how much they're interested in doing research. We do not have a research requirement as MUD does, although um, um, we, uh, the vast majority, above 90% of students will do research. Um, but whether you wanna do one term of research or whether you wanna do research every term is really up to the student. And um, how much time you dedicate to that is again, kind of driven by your own interests and aptitudes. Um, in terms of a civic engagement, most um, formal civic engagement at MIT is organized through the Priscilla King Gray uh, Center for Public Service, including um, the MIT All-In Voter Registration Challenge, which is run by a team of students, staff, and faculty. Um, and of course, outside of this, there's all kinds of things that um, have the flavor of civic engagement. Um, one thing that I would say is that um, student governance at MIT is kind of notably democratic and devolved to the particular dorms. I'm sure, you know, you could talk to Lainey more if you want to uh, know more about this because Lainey lives in one of the most um, chaotically democratic dorms um, in, ter in terms of kind of devolving um, um, decision-making down to the floor or hall level of like, will we have cats on this hall or do we need to wear clothes in public spaces on this hall or um, anything else um, that they sort of hash out through civic engagement? And, and I, all joking aside, I actually think that's really significant because the way that you learn to live in a democratic society is by doing democracy. 
Um, and if your start on that is by figuring out um, through some kind of process, who's going to live where on the floor and how things are going to get cleaned, um, that actually is part of a broader civic engagement strategy that then gets applied to other domains. I think I'll amplify what, what Chris said and that I think it's a, it's, there's a good number of staff, but I think a more persuasive element will be the student voice and the faculty voices, particularly, uh, I see it more prominently among the junior faculty who've joined our institution, that they're very much engaged with this, uh, with, with these kinds of uh, considerations of a, of, a, of a bigger world. Uh, there are any college that you go to is going to have some sort of community engagement office, community service office. Uh, the, the students will find are, are bright enough and have enough initiative to to pursue this with 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 real vigor, and the college will respond appropriately. Uh, as far as research, you can you you don't have to start early. You'll be plastered with opportunity to do so. We hire students over the summer to do research. Uh, we pay them to do research. And then you have a, a requirement in your senior year to have a capstone experience. So the, the, in terms of the hours per week, if it's a summertime, it's 40 hours a week. During the academic year, it's probably in the neighborhood of like three to six, something like that. So you have, uh, you can spend your time on other things. This next question from Alex K is in the chat and it may be also related to the research topic. His question is how does having or not having a graduate school affect the, the college or university or does it not really make a difference to the undergrads? You go ahead, Chris, if you'd like. Well, I was going to say, I don't, I don't know. I've only ever attended. I went to the University of Massachusetts and then I came to work at MIT and both have grad students. So I don't think that I have the best answer here. But what I would say generally is I suspect, and I would, I would love Peter to, to share his own expertise um, here, is that it's, it's one of these things where um, it does make a difference, but what kind of difference and which difference is better for you is kind of... Um, dependent on what you're looking for out of your college education and um, what things will be benefited by having um, distraught 20 somethings embedded in uh, PhD programs around um, or, or not. Uh, I grew up in the shadow of the University of Washington and I have many friends who went to that institution who took the initiative to forge strong relationships with faculty and, to, and with peers. I think there's a, there, it, 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 your initiative can happen any place. I think at a small school, it's almost unavoidable that the faculty are there. They've made a conscious decision to work at a school that is exclusively devoted to your growth as a person, to mentor you, to, to give you the research opportunities, to help you become the best undergraduate that you can possibly be. And uh, the grad, they, they maintain relationships with graduate institutions. So our students want to go, go get a PhD or some other type of advanced degree. They're, they're in a great, great position to do so. But I think I'm a product only of undergraduate uh, education, both in my work experience and my living, lived experience. And I think it's a tremendous asset to have everything right there in front of you where you're the sole focus of our entire institution, all of our resources. But that's a personal opinion. Uh, just a just, reminder, oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to add to that. Um, it does make a difference. If you're an undergrad at an institution, which obviously most large research universities have graduate students. And that means that the graduate students are doing a lot of the research under professors. Professors dedicate a lot of their time and energy to their grad students if they have them. And that means they're just by definition not devoting time and energy to the undergrads. Um, it also, that, that's one difference. The other difference is if you are at an institution with grad students, you will find sometimes that a grad student is teaching you and instead of a professor. That just happens. 
more or less, depending on the place. But um, those two are, are differences you would definitely notice. I'll add one other. My, my, my son is, a, is all but dissertation at a well-known public university. He's funded for them. This, this deals with, with funding issues as well. Who gets the resources of the institution? And uh, they need him to do that. And he is the apple of the, faculty, the faculty's eye in that program, not some sophomore. And uh, I, I think that's a, that's a significant difference. Yeah, all very important points. And I just want to remind everyone that we are going to try to close at 11.45. And this is uh, also for the sake of um, our admissions representatives who have spent these uh, past uh, almost two hours with us. And they are actually going to be talking to astrophysics for the next two hours, just so you guys know. Um, but we're delighted to have them here. And we're going to go to Jolyn first and then followed by Rishab. Okay, uh, hello. Um, this question is for both of you. And I apologize if this seems um, kind of basic because uh, I never really considered prestigious colleges until FFP, but um, how flexible are both of your colleges with <clears throat> um, changing majors, um, I suppose like midway through you know, the college experience? Chris, you go first, if you don't mind. Sure. So um, I think for both of our schools, if I have it right, um, you don't declare a major until the end of your first year. Um, and um, that is, uh, gives some more flexibility right off the bat than at other schools where you declare kind of on the way in. Um, after that, it's sort of, at MIT, it's sort of how late can you get away with it um, in terms of, um, you know, there's going to come a point where you've spent more time at the college, the university, and then um, um, you, you, you have taken all these classes and you've like continued to specialize. Then it becomes harder and harder to graduate on time with the number of classes you'll have to take if you're going to switch. Or it might be easy to switch from bio to biochemistry, but harder to switch from bio to economics. Um, but I think for us, a general institutional philosophical point is we really try to lower the red tape. And it's just kind of like, these are the graduation standards for this major. If you achieve those by the time you want to graduate, then you have that major and go with God. Um, whereas it's not as kind of constrained earlier on in the process. I put my answer into the chat. I hope that'll speed things along. Terrific. How about Rishab? Thank you. Um, I know that at SSP, a lot of students being surrounded by brilliant students from around the world have felt some sort of or form of imposter syndrome. And of course, the SSP staffs have been very encouraging and re reaffirming of us. I can only imagine how it must feel for students that go to MIT and Harvey Mudd to feel that same sort of feeling. I was wondering, like, to what extent do students at MIT and Harvey Mudd feel those? And what does MIT and Harvey Mudd do to, like, help those, help those types of feelings? If I can go first on this one, everyone feels it. I, I feel it. Uh, our president actually has meetings with students in their first year to talk about her feelings of being the imposter, despite being one of the few women ever on the board at Microsoft, despite being leading uh, all, all, the, this institution, being the dean of the engineering program at Princeton before she came to MUD. It, it, it's a great driver for productivity in some respects, but it's got a really dark side. And so we try to confront that. We talk about how important it is to engage other people, to raise your hand, to ask for help, to be self-aware. Fortunately, at our institution, you're surrounded by people who are looking out for you and it's hard to slip through the cracks. Um, I would say in addition to that, um, one of the things that I know is true at MIT and I suspect is true at Harvey Mudd is that everybody has an experience of being bad at something and thinking, oh God, oh God, oh God, I, I failed chemistry. Oh God, they made, I'm the mistake. And look at my roommate, my roommate's doing really well in chemistry. And then your, your roommate, the next term is like really barely making it through physics and you're doing well in physics. 
And that experience of realizing that everybody is having some kind of challenge, as long as there's more of that kind of public conversation. And I will say that there's a, there's a thin line between the kind of like, um, and, and this is something that just has to be constantly managed, between being open and transparent about shared struggles and um, bonding through uh, myopic focus on like, oh, everything's so bad, we're all so bad, everything's awful all the time. Um, that's not just a like our colleges thing. I'll drop an academic paper in the chat about collective identity formation through student problem memes. Um, but I think that, that generally that experience that people have of realizing like, oh, well, I may not be the best chemistry student, but my roommate's not the best physics student and the kid across the hall is not the best math student. We've all got strengths and weaknesses. It's not about being the best anymore. It's about pursuing our interests and aptitudes is the real key to unlock. Great, we're gonna close with uh, Jang and then Isabel. So final two questions here and there'll be some activity in the chat as well. Great, thank you. Um, so I just had uh, two quick questions. So they're, I guess they're directed to both of you. Um, so the first one is that um, I know that we're all still in high school. So I was wondering if there are any like tangible benefits or opportunities that your schools offer that we don't, that you might not be aware of right now. And my second question is that um, as we approach our application process, um, is there any advice or things that we should look out for or be aware of um, as we start like writing our essays or start um, compiling like materials? In the spirit of a lightning round, I would say that our website, we have a lot of stuff about like enrichment programs, academic programs and other things to take advantage of. And my um, one line advice for you would be, don't overthink your essays and applications in terms of trying to impress us. Um, you're not going to be able to. It's we're admissions officers at highly selected prestigious universities. It's like our job to just understand you. Um, if instead of writing your essays to the extent you were thinking about doing this as like trying to impress like really notoriously unimpressible, um, you know, Russian gymnast judges or whatever, um, you should instead write them as if they were a friendly distant relative who you saw at a family reunion and they just said, hey, what do you do for fun? And then you just answered them. And something with that level of introspection and um, unselfconsciousness is probably gonna help you write the most effective essay. I'm gonna take your advice and, and, and twist the question. My advice to you all is to forge a relationship with a professor early in your college career. That'll, that'll serve you immensely well uh, for your future. Um, as for the opportunity to engage, we can't, we can't make you engage things, but we're gonna prevent you, present you with a lot of opportunities. And because of the, the nature of the, of the peer group that you've joined, I think there'll be a lot of opportunities that will fall into your lap. It's a matter of you taking that opportunity and with, with some judgment about how you're gonna use your time best. Isabel, you have the last question here. Hi, so I guess my question goes to both schools. My question is essentially, what are some of the resources that give your institutions their identities? This could be facilities or programs or organizations at your institutions. For us, the answer is really simple. It's our mission that, that defines us. I, I think for us, it's the dorms. Um, students identify while they're at MIT most centrally with their living communities and the particular um, things that they do for fun, what's meaningful for them, what they can build, what they can do, what they can, the community that they can create with each other to have a sense of home away from home. Excellent. Well, this closes our college roundtable. Let's um, give a warm applause um, in digital form to our two presenters and the TAs and Mr. Bowden for being here and sharing their experiences and insights.